Good morning. Good, good evening, everybody. Welcome once again to OL Nation, session two, series one. We've got a great uh, show lined up for you guys. Thank you so much for all your support and for signing on. Uh, don't forget, tell your friends in case they can't uh, come online on the Zoom call. They can uh, just log into Facebook. It's available on Facebook Live at the OLA channel. It's available on YouTube Live uh, at the OLA channel. Uh, I, would I, I would like to thank everybody, our panelists, moderators, and hosts who have worked really very hard for the last four weeks to get the show up and running. And without further ado, I'll hand you over to uh, Johnny Paul. Johnny is the OLA uh, president, and he will talk to you about uh, the OLA's latest projects and what it has in mind. Uh, what 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 what's in what's in the plan for us? Welcome, Johnny. Hi everyone, this is Johnny Paul, the president of the Old Laurentians Association, an alumni association of the Lawrence School, Lovedale. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming and watching this program. In case you're not able to watch it today, it's always available on the OLA site. Okay. The Old Laurentians Association conducts two separate programs. One is called the OL Nation, and the other is called the OIL Assembly. The OIL Assembly is basically a variety of entertainment, some social, some nostalgia, some music, and it's basically a light program. The OIL Nation, on the other hand, is a serious program. It's meant for personal development. We come out with professions, uh, mentoring, networking, and even entrepreneurship or whatever we think will be good for the OLs, especially the young and upcoming OLs. Thank you once again. We emphasize this is an old Laurentian Association program and welcome to all of you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, thank you for that, Johnny. And we now have uh, the headmaster of Lawrence School, uh, Lovedale, uh, Mr. Prabhakaran Nair, he will uh, come on and uh, introduce himself to us and tell us a little bit of what's happening at Lovedale. Mr. Nair, you're on right now. Okay. I think he's muted. Oh, yeah, he's on. Good afternoon. Hope all of you can hear me. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for calling me and giving me an opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, good afternoon to all of you. And some some information about Lawrence, which has been happening, uh, or the, the development for the past one, one month. Uh, first of all, I must give you a very positive feedback on uh, the various um, oil initiatives and oil knowledge sharing going on in the school. And uh, we are noting down all those things and some of the very important important sessions, we are recording it and keeping it in our archives. And it'll be a very good, uh, for example, last time's uh, Murad Lala's program. Uh, it was very well appreciated by a large number of students and parents. Now, the most important thing is if we can build up a, a sort of a knowledge base, um, you know, if all OILs can share their experience and we can compile about two to three pages or maybe four pages of all these, we can compile a book, you know, OILs' uh, uh, contribution and, and their uh, various uh, areas of their contribution. We can make it and we can make a small book publication, which we can keep it in our archive uh, department. So this will be a sort of um, uh, knowledge sharing for uh, uh, the batches and batches of uh, OILs. Uh, OIL. So that will be one idea. And uh, anyway, we are recording it. And if you can send the, if whatever information you have with reference to various OILs who have, who have made a, a remarkable contribution in, in distinct areas, that can be a very good resource for us. You know, 162 years of our existence, and we, mu we must be having about 150 to 160 OILs. Yes. Um, batches. They can all contribute it, and that will be an excellent knowledge base in our archival uh, uh, department. I'm working on it and I will contact individually each one of them and you can also share a word with all of them so that we can work on it. 
Second thing is, of course, uh, uh, there are a lot of news going on in the local newspaper about, you know, Lawrence School, Loudale. There are a lot of uh, uh, quarantine situation. Qu quarantine patients are uh, in a lodge in Lawrence School. Uh, COVID patients from Nilgiri District. So I must make it very clear to you. You know, in the entire Nilgiri District, for the past uh, two weeks, the number of COVID patients have gone up. And uh, the district administration, along with the health department, has identified quite a few schools to help them. They actually asked us to help them and support them to keep two patients as quarantine who are, who are basically the secondary contact, not the primary contact, secondary contact. Uh, they're not showing any symptoms, but in case they have symptoms, they will be kept in, in the schools. For example, Good Shepherd is taken as a treatment center apart from AMH and GH, and then St. Jude School, uh, Laidla and uh, Government Inter College uh, Kunur and uh, all these and Lawrence School Loudale. Now we had about 80, 80 patients, 80 not patients actually quarantine cases for the past uh, one week. They came in last Saturday and most of them left today. Today is the last date. The 30 uh, uh, of uh, 20 left day before yesterday, 50 left uh, uh, two days back. And today was the last batch, 30 of them. They were under observation for one week, 30 of them left. But however, I, I parked them in the junior school ground floor and um, all my teachers, and there are eight teachers who are staying on the first floor. I relocated them. They were all, uh, you know, accommodated in some other areas. I don't want any of our community members. We have about 310 members staying in the community. I don't want them to be affected by this. That precaution worked out well. And today, all of them moved out. And the entire team is here sanitizing the entire section, entire area. And we are out of it. However, it's very important that we, being an educational organization, it's our responsibility to support and help our country cousins. After all, we are here in this place for the past 162 years when uh, the local uh, people out here are suffering and struggling because of this problem. It's very, very important. We should show that leadership to help them out. We don't have to provide anything. We, uh, basically, to, to help them to, to quarantine for one week. We have done it, and the district administration has appreciated very well. And uh, we also distributed a few uh, materials a couple of weeks back to the Pania uh, tribal group in in Gudalur and Pandalur, and we are doing ourselves whatever we can for the uh, people to, to combat with the COVID situation case at the moment in in Nilgiri district. And of course, the result is uh, result has come, and uh, we have we had about. Uh, um, 117 students who appeared for class 10th, they all passed and average result is 84 percentage and class 12th also result has come. Average is uh, again uh, um, 84.3 percentage and uh, ranging from 55 to 85. Of course, I'm not mentioning the name and distinction because academic is one part of the process of education. Some are 84, some are 94, some are 96, 98.4 is the highest. At the same time, 55.4 is the lowest. Anyway, it's a part of our, our, our life and uh, academics goes on. Uh, I don't want to uh, glorify uh, all these things. We all uh, put in the best. Uh, some students get uh, good marks, some students with average, they're all OLs. They have contributed in their own areas. We are happy about the result. And um, other, other areas are, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, thinking of uh, one important uh, uh, issue here is that, uh, you know, I hope uh, your community doesn't, uh, doesn't mind if I record uh, some of the important programs which you are giving, and these programs can be updated in our website. Uh, some of those information can be very, very useful, and we will update in our website. Yes. So that our students <coughs> uh, uh, you know, get an idea of uh, the contribution of uh, uh, Laurentian community, not only uh, to- Of your Laurentians, yes. Yeah. Oils. So I'm, I'm working on it. So, I'm, I'm, yeah. okay. So, so, Mr. Mr. Prabhakaran, so, yeah, just to, just to recap, uh, uh, a lot of the work we are doing behind the scenes uh, yeah. is when we are, uh, all these programs are completely recorded. There's a lot of planning that goes on. Okay. And what we are doing is post uh, the event, we are splicing it into specific segments, into specialities. And as we go on, every month, we will have two to three, uh, uh, you know, uh, different um, sections. Uh, part one and part two. Each part will be separately uh, stored, and we've we've created a micro site, and it's also available on the OLA website as well. And we will, you know, share everything with you because this uh, project is, you know, although uh, it was conceived as of OLs, by OLs, and for OLs, it's basically for the Lovedale family, and it includes all our stakeholders. And if we can add value and enhance everybody's 
you know, professional career or life or in any way possible, I think it's a great thing. And thank you so much for updating us on what's happening in Lovedale. Yes, even I, I got some news um, uh, on, the on the television. It's great that, you know, as a 160 year old institution, we are giving back to our community um, and uh, just staying positive. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for supporting our event. And we look forward to you know having you again um, uh, you. over the next uh, several months. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you. And um, uh, so <clears throat> right now we have Captain Arjun Nayar, Sumeru 1976. Uh, he is my co-host uh, for the evening, and he will be he will be introducing uh, where, uh, the other speakers to you as well as the as well as the moderators. Okay. Uh, Captain, you're on right now. Yeah, good evening, OL family. Very nice to be with you once again after a month. And uh, like uh, Rohan said, we've got excellent uh, responses from you and feedback on which we have acted. One of the main things I want to mention before I talk about, uh, introduce the moderator, is that about the Q&A. We had uh, a lot of doubts coming in and feedback on that basis. Now, when the panelist starts talking, if you have any question in your mind, Post it on the Q&A uh, icon from, uh, if you're on the web, if you're on YouTube or um, uh, Facebook, please post it on the chat. We have volunteers who will pick it up from there and direct it to the moderator. Don't wait for the end of the session. Go ahead and start uh, uh, asking questions right from the beginning. To get on with it, if you still have questions thereafter, panelists will attend to it post-session. And you can always use the email ID contact at olnation.com for further uh, questions that you might want answered by uh, Dr. Arab or any of the other panelists who are very uh, uh, forthcoming and saying they would certainly oblige. Now, in conversation with Dr. Dinesh Arab this evening, in, with the topic Iron Man and Your Heart, we have Nikhil Bojwani. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Nikhil, Sumeru, 1988. Now, Nikhil is the managing partner at Recon. He focuses on strategy and innovation topics for payers, providers, and population health firms. Before founding Recon, Nikhil spent eight years at the Boston Consulting Group, where he was a core member of strategy and healthcare practice areas. Experienced in working with health plans, biotech, pharma companies, medical devices, and healthcare services, Nikhil has helped his clients innovate execute solutions, develop strategy, make critical business decisions and plan and enable executive level, level and organization-wide change. Prior to BCG, Nikhil co-founded and ran media businesses in India and was a guest columnist and author. He's a graduate of St. Stephen's College and the Wharton School. Giving you Nikhil Bojwani. Hey, Nikhil, all yours. I, I presume by now uh, Dinesh should have come online. And if he hasn't come online, I'd like you to introduce yourself. Okay, that's me. Thank you, Arjun. So our next speaker has more letters after his name than I have in my name. But for me, he'll always be my junior at Sumeru House, where as a bouncer, my official job description was to make life difficult for him and his batchmates. But now 20 plus years on, I have the distinctly more agreeable job of introducing Dr. Dinesh Arab to those of you who don't already know him or know of him. Dinesh is a renowned interventional cardiologist and a physician leader. He is a widely published researcher and award-winning professor. And if that wasn't enough, you'll hear today that he has somehow found time to compete in triathlons. Dinesh is going to talk to us today about matters of the heart. In about 40 minutes, he will cover cardiac and vascular anatomy, describe what happens in heart attacks and strokes, introduce us to some cutting edge technologies and treatments, and give us his own personal take on staying fit. So Dinesh is gonna cover a lot of theory in this rapid fire session, so get your notebooks out. But this is not theoretical. The one thing we all have in common, besides our never given spirit, is that we all have a heart literally, if not figuratively. And when that ticker stops ticking before it's time, it can be tragic. This became all too real for our batch, OL88, when our dear friend Gautam Nanda 
had a heart attack during Founders at our 30th batch reunion and very sadly passed away. What Dinesh has to share will change how you live your life, will change what you can do to help others around you and could save lives. So let me get out of the way of the Iron Man, Dr. Dinesh Arum. Thank you, Nikhil. Um, yeah, I'm um, sorry about um, Gautam. And um, I hear this and I see this every day more than I should, but um, hopefully today's session will educate you all about the heart and, um, and um, get, get you to know your heart a little better. So the heart's this amazing, amazing machine. I mean, think about it. It works nonstop for 70 to 100 years. It uh, generates its own electricity and it can make energy in real time. So come with me and let's take a look at this amazing, extraordinary machine that makes a NASA spaceship look like a very inexpensive toy, really. So this is what's happening inside you right now as we speak. And I'll make this really quick and simple. You get impure blood into the right side of your heart. It pumps it out through this big tube called the pulmonary artery into your lungs. The lungs purify it, get it back to the left side. And the left side pumps it into this big tube called the aorta to the rest of your body. Now, these chambers are separated by these valves, which are essentially doors. You know all that gobbledygook you read on Facebook about one door closing and another door opening? Yeah, this is where it all starts. So what's the point of all this, you may ask? Um, well, the point of all this is energy. You know, we think of ourselves as this higher human species with some kind of purpose in life, but our bodies are just like any other basic animals and all they're interested in doing is making energy. So how do we make energy? Well, the food you eat, no matter what fancy restaurant you go to, is broken down into glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids. That stuff is dumped into your blood and taken to the rest of your body through these little tubes called arteries. But there's one other ingredient you need to convert that fuel into energy, and that's oxygen. Through a process called cellular respiration, that fuel is converted into billions of batteries called ATP that discharge in real time and create energy. But there's one little caveat. You can create energy, but you can't store energy. And that's why without oxygen, you're dead in three minutes. Why? Your cells run out of energy. So come, let's take a look at this lifeline, which um, gets energy to all our systems. This is what it looks like. A bunch of tubes called arteries. Now your heart itself needs energy and it's provided through these arteries uh, that supply the heart. When you have a heart attack, that area of your heart, um, the blood supply is blocked. You, that part of the heart dies. Why does it die? Cells run out of energy. This main artery gives arteries to, uh, to your brain. And again, um, the same thing happens if uh, you stop blood supply to the brain, you have a stroke. Why do you have a stroke? You run out of energy. Same thing with the gut. That's how you get gangrene. Uh, you get the drift from there on. Now, interventional cardiology, which is what I do, is a process of getting into an artery either in the leg or hand, going all the way into your heart and fixing the heart without stopping the heart and without cutting the chest open. It takes only 13 years to be an interventional cardiologist. Uh, it's uh, partly because we are slow learners, but also because of the amount of technology that's coming down the pike. There are only two specialties uh, which were left standing when I was done. There was the neurosurgeons and there were us. Now let's do a deep dive into these arteries and look what's going on. This is a cross-sectional area of your coronary artery. And this is what a healthy artery of a graduating uh, student from Lovedale looks like. And this is what it looks like by the time you're 20. This is what happens by the time you're 30, you're chasing whatever you're chasing and this stuff's growing inside you. So what causes plaque formation? Well, the inside of your heart is lined by this, uh, sorry, this blood vessel is lined by this super smooth st um, uh, structure called endothelium. And it's very biologically active. I mean, it's making stuff, it's uh, testing the pH, it's constricting the artery, it's dilating, and it's like a factory when you look at it in a microscope. Anything that damages that endothelium causes fat cells to get in, your bad cholesterol to get in, and the plaque formation starts. So what causes damage to the endothelium? Age, genetics, smoking, Blood pressure, that sheer stress of a, a pressure causes damage, high blood glucose levels, and bad luck. So here we go, you are living your life and this thing is growing into you and you come to this point where you may have some chest discomfort with little exertion or you may be totally asymptomatic. You can even go to a doctor 
He'll check you out, say everything's good. You may walk out and this plaque might rupture. Now, once that rupture, your body uh, blood thinks that the defenses have been breached and it tends to clot it off. And suddenly you're in the middle of a full blown heart attack. It's completely occluded. So what does a heart attack feel like? Well, you'll know something's wrong. You'll have chest discomfort. You'll have shortness of breath. You'll feel difficulty in breathing, you'll break out in a sweat. But one of the most common things that patients have told me is that they have this impending feeling of doom that they're going to die. This is what it looks like in real time. Don't blow us, yes, sir. That's an artery which is completely sure, blocked. And you can see, yeah, if I can pause it here, yeah. This tube should come all the way down and you can see it's abruptly being cut off over here. Now in the USA, uh, the process is straightforward. You pick up the phone, call 911, an ambulance is there between five and seven minutes. They do an EKG in real time. They transmit that EKG to the ER. ER transmits that EKG to us. I'm trying to have a romantic dinner with my wife. My phone goes off, I drop everything. I meet you in the ER, take you up to the lab, get into an artery in your leg, find the blockage, and then I fix it. And this is what it looks like. You can see I put a little wire down there. I've opened it with a balloon and stent. And um, that's how we fix it. We aim for something called door to balloon time. That means by the time you hit the door of the hospital to the time I get the balloon up in and open the blockage, it should be less than 90 minutes. If we go over 90 minutes, we have some serious questions we need to answer. Now I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie, but this fixing a heart attack and saving a patient's life is one of the most um, rushes I ever get. Uh, you have the patient coming in half dead, moaning, groaning, every monitor in the OR is going off. And the minute I get that balloon in there, everything gets silent. And then I start having a conversation with my patient. But there's one other thing that can happen. Before you pick up the phone and dial 911, sometimes your heart can go into a short circuit and you can drop dead, a condition very obviously called sudden cardiac death. Now here we are simulating cardiac death in the lab. We are creating that to deploy a valve. The top number is your heart rate and your bottom number is your blood pressure. This is a busy screen, so just concentrate on these two. And when I create sudden death in the lab, or I say start rapid pacing, which makes the heart go really fast, um, it's in a very calm voice. It's not like you see in the ER series where everybody's running around and screaming. This is like, honey, can you pass me the coffee? Start rapid pacing. So here we go. Look what happens. This is within three seconds, your blood pressure is gone. You're going down at this point. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be a big shot industrialist, a multi-billionaire, a head of state, a lover, a fighter, a cardiologist, you're going down. And if this continues, you're essentially dead. Look what happens. It's just a complete flat line. Um, so what do you do if you see somebody going down um, suddenly like this? Well, the first thing you do is you take your fist and give one blow to the lower part of the chest. That generates about two to five joules of energy and it's unlikely to work. You might gotta be having a real good day for that to work. You need about 200 joules to break that uh, re-entry circuit. What do you do next? You put your hands together and start compressing at the lower part of the sternum at about 100 to 120 beats per minute. You're essentially externally compressing the heart and you know the remaining oxygen is being um, sent around to your tissue so that you can stay alive. But you're going to run out of oxygen uh, even doing that, and you've got to start mouth to mouth and supply oxygen. It's just take a deep breath in, form a seal to the mouth of the person down, and just blow in there and close the nostrils. Even with good CPR, you can hold out for about five minutes as a layperson, but you've got to shock the heart after that. Now, in the US, uh, the American Heart Association, which I'm a part of, we have promoted the use of defibrillators all over the place, in schools, in gymnasiums, in airports. Um, I'm not sure whether the headmaster is there, but the school I would recommend have, um, if, not the, if not already having a defibrillator in prep school, junior school, senior school, the gym and girls school, because this stuff can happen to kids um, with electrocu you know, when they get electrocuted or suffocated or on the sports field or in a swimming accident. And times of the essence, we're talking about five minutes here. The defibrillators are very easy to use. You just put the pads on, those things run it from there. Even if you're living in a, um, you know, a 
faraway area, like on a T estate or something, that's an investment I would recommend uh, you all making. Actually, we had a patient just the other day. Um, he just down the hall, went on a treadmill, sat down and went into this cardiac arrest. Somebody shouted like, hey, we need a doctor. I went in there, paddled him. Uh, don't get excited. It's um, paddling is shocking in medical slang. And um, he came right back. So I asked him, I said, hey, when you were down there, did you see any beautiful women or any bright lights? And he said, no. He said, one minute I was sitting there and I'm not feeling quite right. And the next minute you were shaking me and asking me these smart ass questions. I said, well, it could have been a lot worse. Imagine if you'd seen your ex-wife in there. And he's like, yeah, that, that, that really would have been scary. Now, once you have this disease, we can do all sorts of sexy stuff to you. I mean, sexy for me, not so sexy for you, but this is how a stent is made. You take a piece of um, cobalt chromium, you shape it into a sinusoid, wrap it into a helix, laser fuse it, and boom, you got a stent. Through nanotechnology, we can put drug on the stent to elute over whatever time we feel like. Uh, six weeks, three months, six months. Mount it on a balloon and you are in business. So we get, like I said, the stenting procedure, we come in through an artery in your leg, find the artery in your heart, put a wire down. This is a stent going in over a balloon. And this is what a stenting procedure looks like. If you're ever in it, balloon goes up, stent is deployed and the balloon comes out. So that's a stenting procedure. Now, sometimes your arteries are filled with calcium, which is essentially rock. And this is what that looks like. This is inside an artery. And you can't open that with a stent. The stent is going to be deformed in there and you've got to actually drill it out. So we do have a drill that we can use to drill it out. And this is what that looks like. Just for context, a Ferrari goes at 10,000 RPM. A jet engine goes at 25,000 RPM. This little baby goes at 150,000 RPM. It works on a process of differential cutting, like when you're shaving, where you know you cut the skin and the blade bounce, I mean, cut the uh, hair and the blade bounces off the skin. Same thing here, this thing will drill the calcium and then bounce off the healthy vessel wall. What happens to all that junk? It's so small that your body can absorb it. Now we were part of the teams that actually brought this technology to mankind. Orbit 2 was the first study that the FDA made us do to get this study, get this device approval for commercial use. Uh, Orbit One was outside uh, the United States. So there's my name. I was representing our team and there's Daytona Beach. So that was our contribution to science. Now you may look at all this and say, hey, Mr. Big Shot Cardiologist, this is all very well, but what do we do? Well, there's not much you can do about genetics. Those are the cards you've been dealt. I mean, for example, my brother and me, we come from the same gene pool. He's got high blood pressure, I got low blood pressure, but he's got the good looks and charm and I got this mug face. So it kind of all evens out over time. But here are things under your control. One, your blood glucose uh, should be less than 100. We're talking about a fasting blood glucose level. You should know these numbers. Why is that important? That chronically elevated blood glucose can cause damage to that endothelium that I talked to you about earlier. Blood pressure should be less than 120 by 80. Why is that? The sheer stress of blood uh, of the blood pressure it literally it's a tube, and the pressure will cause damage to that endothelium, and uh, that can cause um, uh, blockages. That's why it's called a silent killer. It just keeps damaging your arteries as you go. Fasting blood uh, um, LDL uh, cholesterol less than 100, and total cholesterol less than 200. Why? Again, I told you about the LDL cholesterol going in there and starting the plaque and body mass index between 18.6 and 24.9. This formula is available on the web. You can use it. It's basically a weight for your height. And those fat deposits actually secrete uh, inflammatory substances that go and damage that endothelium. And that's how that works. A couple of quick things. Uh, Asian male, Asian males and women, we have very high subgroup. They're currently doing a study called the Masala study, which is mediators of atherosclerosis and South Asians living in, in America. And they've already found that we particularly are risk prone because we have this belly fat. Um, women, you're protected till you hit menopause, but you play catch up after that. It's still the number one cause of death in women. Um, as always, um, women are confusing. We thought that if we give you hormones post menopause, it will protect you just like it was before menopause, but it didn't. It actually caused more heart attacks. So you got to concentrate on these four things that I told you about. Now, the young people in the audience will say, hey, listen, this is a problem for all you old dudes uh, and um, ladies. This is not our problem. Well, think again. 
I'm a cardiologist. We find problems in everybody. There is a thing called cryptogenic stroke. A cryptogenic in medical slang means we don't know what the hell it is. But you come in with symptoms of a stroke, and it's generally in younger people. And what are the symptoms of a stroke? Well, you can, any time you can't control a part of your body that you normally could control, that's a symptom of a stroke. You can't speak, or you've got a weakness in a hand. Um, you, you can think, but you can't get the words out. That's, those are all s- symptoms of stroke. So you'll come in with a stroke. The CT scan shows the evidence of a stroke in the brain. But when we take a look at the artery, it's normal. And for the longest time, we didn't know what to do with uh, the cryptogenic stroke. And we would just throw uh, blood thinners and send you on your way. Well, we started noticing that a lot of people with cryptogenic stroke were born with a hole in the heart. The hole itself isn't a problem. And um, some of you will disagree with me, but uh, stay with me on this. Normally, what happens is impure blood with particulate matter comes into the right side and it goes into the lungs and the lungs act as this giant filtration field. Now suddenly because this hole is there, you're that, this is some clots coming in that should normally go to the lung. It can get through that hole. Now you're on the left side and you can go up and cause a stroke because your arteries to your brain come off as the first branch from this major artery. So here's the clot going up to cause a stroke. And what happens is your body dissolves that blood clot after the stroke is there. So when we take a look, everything looks normal. One of my first patients who was referred for this was this young lady um, who actually um, had a stroke while having sex. And uh, she went and saw the doctor as usual. This was a cryptogenic stroke. They put her on a bunch of blood thinners, sent her on her way. Fast forward four years, she wanted to get pregnant wanted to come off blood thinners. Uh, We started knowing a little more about this at that time. She went to a hematologist, he sent it to me. This was still not FDA approved, but we had approval to close this on a humanitarian basis. So she's telling me the story and I can't help but think, man, if that ain't the definition of mind blowing, I don't know what is. Anyway, I tell her this joke later when we're friends and she has a good laugh and she's like, hey, can you fix this? I'm like, damn right I can. You, we do this under local anesthesia. We get, we find that hole, put a little tube there, and there's this little slinky that kids play with. It's got two discs and a spring in between, and that's what it is. You deploy the first part of the slinky, pull the tube back, and uh, deploy the second part of the slinky, and the hole's closed. I mean, previously, you'd have to crack the chest, uh, go on cardiopulmonary bypass and close it, and this takes 30 minutes. You're up and walking. This story had a happy ending. Uh, she came off blood thinners, got pregnant, She now calls me her mind-blowing doctor. There's a lot of other cool um, stuff we have uh, with uh, with relation to stroke. We can stent your carotids. We can put a basket up to prevent stuff from going up. We can reverse flow from one side of the brain to the other with the concept that if blood flow is coming down, you can't send particulate matter up. But things weren't so easy all the time. In the 1950s, the heart was an untouchable. I mean, medicine was progressing and all areas of the body, but the heart was untouchable. And part of the reason was because they thought if you can, if you instrument that coronary artery when the heart's pumping, you'll kill the person. In 1959 in Cleveland Clinic, there was this young doctor who was doing, who was just taking a picture of the aorta, you know, that big tube coming out of the heart. And he had put a catheter into the aorta just to take a picture. And by mistake, it popped into a coronary artery. And he thought, man, I'm going to kill this patient, but nothing happened. And so he devised this procedure called coronary angiogram, and that was enough. The surgeons picked it up. 1960, the first bypass was done. And you had these brilliant surgeons. You had Cooley, DeBakey, and cardiothoracic surgery just took off. And by the end of the 1960s, the first first heart transplant was done, and we read about this in school by Christian Barner. Well, through all this, the cardiologists were pretty much holding their, um, let's say, thumbs. And um, it was till I was an eight-year-old joining Lovedale uh, that a German doctor by name Andreas Grutzig came up with this concept of putting a balloon down the heart without stopping it and blowing up the balloon with the patient awake. Uh, Germans thought he was nuts. They had just come out of Second uh, World War and they said, listen, we don't want this on our conscience. So they kicked him out of Germany. He went to Switzerland and he actually did the first procedure there and it worked. Grutzig became famous and interventional cardiology was born. Grutzig after that came to Emory, which is an hour north of where I am. And one of my senior partners actually went, learned angioplasty from him and came and started the program here that I'm uh, inherited. 
Grotzing was this charismatic, debonair, handsome guy. He was an instrumented rated uh, pilot and uh, he died in an aircraft which he was flying and he was younger than me when um, uh, he died. It took another 10 years and I was leaving school at this point when the first stent was made. Uh, it took another 10 years for that uh, drug coated stent to be made when uh, you know that nanotechnology that I talked to you and I was a cardiology fellow by this time. But through all this, the valves were considered out of touch because you know how do you how do you fix a valve a, a moving door that opens and closes every second in a pump that's moving without stopping the heart well there was a doctor by name um uh, Cribier, a french doctor who came up with this thing called valvuloplasty where you put the balloon into the valve and blow it up I was an interventional fellow by this time, and I was working with some of the best minds in the world in Chicago, and we were following Cribier's work, and we were doing this. And I would call this a Hail Mary procedure. Hail Mary in football analogy is you throw the ball up and hope it lands in the right hands. That's pretty much what we were doing. We were blowing this balloon up and hoping it worked because your arteries to your heart come off right here. You go a little too in and the pump starts, and over there are the arteries to your brain. So you blow it up and hope you don't rupture this whole thing or send stuff up and cause a stroke. We would do this only for inoperable patients and um, I would get nauseous scrubbing for these procedures, but that's all we had. But Cribier persisted, he came up with a valve mounted on a stent, but you had to nail it just right. We're talking about millimeters over here. And in 2003, the first valve was done. It took another 10 years for that valve to be commercially available in the US. And by then I was leading the valve program over here and I was tasked with the uh, you know, um, program to start a valve program here. We uh, joined a national debate on you know, who should be doing this um, valve. Um, the surgeons went to the FDA and to CMS and said, listen, we have an established procedure. They would stop the heart um, put you on cardiopulmonary bypass, take the old valve out, put a new valve in. And they said, you're seriously not going to let these bozos go on and just throw these valves in willy-nilly. And the FDA agreed with them. They said, listen, two surgeons got to sign off uh, and say that the patient's not operable before you guys can do the valve. So that was playing out locally. We have a brilliant surgeon here. His name is Jack Holt, and he can get anybody through surgery, albeit at a price. And um, he would take everybody to surgery till we finally got a 94 year old lady who was referred for valve uh, replacement. And I told Jack, I said, you seriously not planning to crack this lady's chest, are you? And he said, okay, you guys can do this as the first one. But she was no ordinary 94 year old. This lady was the face of NASCAR. We are a big racing community over here. And she was the oldest working person. She would still flag off the races, still going to work. And, um, I told my colleague, I said, you know, at 94, you're at risk for a haircut for crying out loud, forget a valve. So we'll put it as a second case. Because we don't want to back off from a challenge either. And then we got our first patient referral. He was a gentleman who had bypass surgery in the past and almost died. And now he had a valve problem and uh, surgeons didn't want to touch him. And his name was Dick Cheney. Yeah, I did a double take too, but he wasn't the vice president. He had a similar name. So Cheney was an interesting guy. He gave me permission to talk about this, of course. Um, and he sits down, I go through the procedure with him. And um, he says, yeah, that's great. He said, how many of these procedures have you guys done? And I said, none, you're the first. And there's this awkward silence. And I said, listen, if uh, I understand if you wanna go somewhere else for this procedure, I'm happy to send you there. And he looks at me and says, no, I think I want you to do it. I trust you. So off we went to the lab. We had our two patients and um, the local uh, press got to know about it. We were the first in the area to do it. The medical community was, um, uh, you know, all excited. OR was packed. The gallery was packed. I actually called uh, both these uh, people the evening before and I told Cheney and uh, the lady, I said, listen, you guys can back out. You don't owe me anything. Cheney was all gung ho. He says, no, no, we're going to be fine. We're going to make the news. He's reassuring me. And I was like, yeah, we're gonna make the news one way or I'm gonna make the news one way or the other. But there was a lot of pressure, let me put it that way. So here we go, we actually recreate the valve inside the body because it's too big to put the balloon and the valve together. So we put the balloon separate, the valve separate, and then we create it inside the body. And then we get it up over the valve. 
And the whole procedure comes down to 15 seconds when you stop the heart. You got to nail it. You go a little higher, patient's dead. You go a little later, uh, lower, the patient's dead. And there are no comebacks, there are no do-overs, it's just one shot. So my whole career was coming down to like 15 seconds that I would either be known as a guy who muffed this program up or the guy who launched it. And so we took our time, got the valve in place, stopped the heart, deployed the valve, and we nailed it. I mean, it was a perfect procedure. We were in and out in 45 minutes, came out of the OR, all kinds of high fives going on. My phone was blowing up, press releases going out. By the time I got back to see Cheney and we did all this, Cheney was already awake and he was like, hey, when can I go home? And that's when I knew that cardiothoracic surgery had no chance and this was gonna be the future. But we had another lady to do and I told everybody, hey, listen, let's uh, hold up. We got the 94 year old uh, still and let's save the congratulations till later. We do the same thing again, nail it again, but she goes into complete cardiac arrest and uh, we're doing CPR and shocking her and I give her some medication on the third shock, she comes back and she does fine too. This is a disclaimer saying, don't try this at home, uh, just in case you guys are wondering. So that's her and me. Uh, this is a year later and she's still doing fine. She's uh, close to a hundred now. The technology has gotten much smoother. It's not Hail Mary technology anymore. This is uh, the current technology. We're putting a valve in. Here I put the valve in too deep and I can recapture it. See here, it's, I'm, I'm encroaching on the mitral. I just recapture it, put it again, uh, pull it up and then redeploy it. Uh, just to let you guys know, we do a hundred and when we started, there were zero transcatheter valves. That's what this is called. And 150 surgical valves. Today, we do about 150 transcatheter and about eight to 10 surgical valves. And uh, Jack's a believer. Cheney gave this to me on our one year anniversary. We had a little party and all, all these patients who had these valves came in and that's a bottle of wine in there. I get a lot of wine. I think my patients think I'm some kind of an alcoholic or something. This place looks like a winery in Christmas, but I'm keeping this one. I think I'll open it um, the day I retire and he calls me his uh, number one patient. And yeah, we do have a special bond. You would think um, we were happy with that. Well, we started going after the mitral valve. Now the mitral valve's a lot more trickier. It's in the middle of the heart. The aortic valve is inside the aorta. And to get to it, even if you come this way, you get stuck in all this stuff, this um, stuff that the valve is attached to. So think of what we're asking of um, the medical field. You're asking with the surgeons to repair a mitral valve, they put a stitch where it's leaking. So you are asking to put a stitch in a valve that opens and closes in less than a second. It is tissue paper thin, it's really fragile. You're talking about a two millimeter thickness in a three centimeter uh, space um, in the middle of the heart without stopping the heart. Sounds like something out of a Mission Impossible movie and the cardiologists uh, hold my beer and watch this. So to mimic a stitch, they came up with something called a clip, which essentially is a stitch, but it's a clip instead. So that's what a leak looks like. And the surgeons would put a stitch there after stopping your heart and this is what a clip looks like. The thing looks like a bazooka and um, you're doing the stitch from outside the body. So to get to the valve, they come up from the left, from the right side, punch a hole in, into the left side. And now you've got access to the valve. Uh, yeah, you got to punch this hole really accurately or you're in trouble right there. And here comes the clip in in real time. The heart still pumping, you're not stopping it. The stuff is tissue paper thin. And I'm looking at this through the eyes of the anesthesiologist. So I'm working outside the human body. This thing's got 140 steps to it. We identify the leak. Here's the valve clip diving into where the um, leak is. And um, we grab the leaflet and that's your stitch. So that's exactly what you're achieving a stitch. We can do one step further than the surgeons. The surgeons, when they stitch, they got to come off pump, check to make sure that they got it. We know it right off the bat. And if we missed it, no sweat. See here, we missed it. It's still leaking. Release it. You can open the clip. 
recapture it and recatch it to where you, you like it. And then you can deploy it. And there it goes, procedure done. A patient's up and walking later on in the day, home the next day. Now, this uh, procedure is still only approved. Uh, it's very late technology and it's only approved for people um, who can't have surgery. Um, when we started this program, I told the patient, hey, listen, this, you're gonna be the first case. By now we were a known entity. It's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You guys know what you're doing, let's go. And so we launched our program. It was no big deal. This is what it looks like on real. This is a 3D echo. So that's a three-dimensional echo. That's the clip right in the center. And uh, that's the valve on either side. This is like the difference with the, the animation is Facebook and this is real life. You're like, whoa, what happened there? To make things even better, this is a completely artificial heart called a LVAD, a left ventricle SS device. Pump goes into the ventricle here, directed into the aorta there. That's what it looks like. Uh, I'm holding this in my hand. That's the latest heart made artificial heart. This is one of my patients with it. It's a drive line that comes out of the body and is attached to the battery. And I call him a heartless man, no pun intended. So that was a lot to partake. And, um, but I'm going to change gears here and um, end up with, we started with energy. I'm going to end with energy. Um, I do this, I did this Iron Man and I want to take you to this journey. I did it in this place called Cozumel in Mexico. There's a story to that, but I won't get into it. And Iron Man is one of the arguably the world's toughest races. And it consists of a 2.4 mile open water swim. That's about four kilometers, which you end up doing. There are no lanes in the ocean. You come out and you do a 180 kilometer bike ride and you might say eh, 180 kilometers is not that bad. Um, but even if you maintain an average speed nonstop at about 26 kilometers an hour, that's going to take you seven hours and 15 minutes. And you have to finish that in um, the swim and the bike in 10 hours. So you're skirting with the uh, time over there. That's a pretty slow time. And then you come out of that and you do a full marathon. Um, and um, for energy standpoint, it takes about 8,000 to 10,000 calories uh, to get through something like that. And if you don't take at least 4,000, it doesn't matter who you are, the best athlete, you're not gonna make it because you're gonna run out of energy. So uh, you might wanna know how I came into this I and mean, why would somebody do anything as crazy as this? Well, I was uh, actually uh, training to climb a mountain, uh, Mount Rainier, and I started getting, that was my passion um, that, I, uh, that I had and I still have. And I started developing some running injuries. So I started biking and swimming. Uh, we never, uh, you know, we were on top of Rainier and we didn't summit unlike Murad that we got hit by a snowstorm and we had to come down, but that's a different story. And so I had uh, met up with these friends who are triathletes and I would train with them. And our routine training was a mile swim, a 35 mile bike ride. And that's what we do every um, uh, Saturday morning and about a 5K run. And I would be exhausted. I mean, hammered to the point that I would want to puke. But a couple of them were doing this Ironman and I thought, let me at least do a half Ironman, which is half these distances. And these Ironmen would get these tattoos. And um, so I was talking to a friend of mine and I was telling her, I'm going to sign up for this half Ironman. And she's like, half, what's that? And um, you, you don't look like a half kind of guy. And I was like, I guess, well, okay, let me, I guess I got to sign up for the full Ironman. So I did sign up and, um, you know, it's a bit of a journey um, and it's uh, self-discovery. My plan was to finish the swim in an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, my bike time was seven hours and 15 minutes. And for nutrition, I was planning to, you got to figure out your nutrition, a completely liquid nutrition, an awful um, uh, thing called perpetuum. And I wanted to do my uh, run in about um, six hours. So about 15 and a half hours was my time that I was estimating. And um, you got to be careful about nutrition. You just can't dump stuff into your system because all your blood flow is going into your skeletal muscle. It takes it off from your gut. So you can only take in 300 calories at a time or you get a condition called rot gut where everything just sits in your stomach. Uh, it's a very unsexy situation. Uh, there's nothing sexy about um, uh, triathlon to start with. Uh, you got uh, sand in strange places, snot up all over the place, uh, sweat, salt, uh, throw and rot gut makes for a very unsexy situation. So here's the journey. Uh, my staff had this on my door. Uh, they called it the PIS. I would wake up at four in the morning, hit the pool by five, swim for an hour and a half, show up for work, uh, finish all these cases, go and jump on the bike. If, when I was on call, I would do an indoor bike. So this is what a routine swim looks like. 
You get out, um, go to a buoy over here, turn around, there's a building over here, turn back in and come on in, and that's about a mile. We have a photographer who comes in every morning and to the beach and he takes pictures of the sunrise and we are his muses and he takes some incredible pictures of us. This is one of our triathletes in there. This is Johnny Charles, he's our best swimmer. He's the only one with the guts to swim alone in this ocean. Uh, we are the shark bite capital of the world. If you Google it, um, it comes up as New Smyrna Beach, which is 10 miles down from us. And I don't think the sharks know borders. This is a picture Jeff took of a dolphin uh, where we swim. Here, you're part of the food chain, and that's part of the risk in um, uh, you know, doing something like this. This is a jellyfish bite, and that's the tame jellyfish. It's not a Portuguese man of war. This is a picture. That's Johnny Charles there, and this is a dolphin. And you can see the size of these uh, animals compared to the human being. My nickname over in this group is Shark Bait because I'm the slowest swimmer. Uh, I tell the group, listen, anybody can be a Johnny Charles. Yeah, it needs character to be Shark Bait. Um, this picture, I'd asked Jeff, I said, hey, can you take a picture of me? I want it for my collection. And he's like, sure. But he said, once you guys get out there, I don't know who's who. I said, oh, that's easy. You know, once we go out, I'll be the last guy coming in. And he took that picture. And that is my safe space when I'm having a bad day. These are sunrises that um, we die for. This is us starting a swim before the um, uh, sun rises and it's dark. And, uh, you know, they say the ocean's a tough uh, mistress. You can love her all you want. She'll never love you back. And some of you may say, hey, genius, uh, that's true of all mistresses, but uh, that's not my area of expertise. This is us. There's Johnny Charles with 0% body fat. Nobody wants to stand next to him. You'll see that I'm wearing this little bracelet that's supposed to be shark repellent that the group got for me. I'm the only guy who wears that. That's our club. If you guys ever come to Daytona Beach, come and hang with us. We're a cool crowd. This is us. Um, there were many races before the Ironman. It doesn't matter if you finish first or last. There's always beer at the end. Um, this is me with a bunch of Ironmen. Uh, yeah, I know. I don't look like an Ironman and I'm the runt of the litter, but there I am. But a lot of Iron Man is um, the sound of loneliness. It's you versus you. That's what it's about. Uh, this is me during one of our hundred mile rides. Um, and, um, you know, I was so tired that I didn't even ring the bell on the crazy woman ranch. So we reach Cozumel. That's my coach and her husband. They're all Iron Men. And from the plane, I was wondering what this uh, stuff was. And it was seaweed. Once you get into it, um, you can't breathe. This is what an Iron Man uh, setup looks like. That's my hotel room the night before. Uh, you, there's no music allowed, no cell phones. Uh, you bring your own nutrition and uh, nobody else is allowed to help you. You got a flat tire. This is my tube and um, is in there and a canister to fill it up. You get to write why you're doing an Iron Man here. I wrote my brother, my family, my friend's uh, mother who is sick. And of course, are never given OL89. That's the batch I'm from. So the Iron Man starts and uh, I nailed the swim. I uh, put in an hour and 45 minutes, it's nice and choppy. I did it in one hour, 30 minutes. Um, I come out there, these showers you run through, get on my bike, the bike's going great, my nutrition's going right. I'm drinking, um, doing one gram of sodium every hour, one liter of water an hour. And everything's going fine till mile 80 when I suddenly develop a cramp in my right leg. And you know, I was on the bike for about six and a half hours uh, at this point. And I thought maybe I was sitting awkward. But then I got a cramp on my left leg as well. And then in the next few minutes before I knew it, my legs went completely limp. And I really thought my race was over. And I was like, I just keep going. And I, I was even worried to get off the bike. I didn't think my legs could support me. And I was wondering what happened, you know, because I'd done this 100 mile ride multiple times in training. And this had never happened before. And I was thinking to myself, and then it hit me. It was really windy that day. We went up to 20 miles headwinds. And I realized I had lot, lost a lot more sweat than I normally do. Um, and uh, I was very dry because the wind was wicking all the uh, sweat off. So I did something that I really don't recommend you guys doing, but I was a medical professional and I thought that, you know, I can get through this. I thought, what would they do to me if I went to the hospital? They would give me normal saline. Normal saline is nine grams of sodium in a liter of water. Well, I had salt tablets, so I took 20 salt tablets, which was two grams of sodium chloride, and just dumped it into my system and followed it with water. You gotta be really careful. If you lift your sodium levels up too quick, you can actually get seizures and uh, you can have um, you know, uh, injury to the brain, which may explain a lot of things about me, but um, that's another story too. 
So I dumped all this stuff in and I waited. Either I was going to end up in a hospital with a seizure or I was going to get better. I got better. I gunned the last 20, 30 miles. Uh, when I got off the bike, my hands were actually in claws. I couldn't even tie my shoelaces. as a volunteer, which is allowed, was allowed to um, you know, tie my laces and I started running. It was already evening, six, I'd started at 7.50 in the morning. It was already uh, six o'clock um, in the evening by the time I got on the run. I've, and I run and it's midnight, I come to my final mile. I was actually starting to feel better on the runs. I started to pee again. My hands got better. I was new, you know, my nutrition was all back to square one. And uh, I stopped for a bit on that last mile. Uh, you know, I'd covered 220 kilometers plus by sea, land and bike. And, uh, um, and um, I was just taking it in and a little overwhelmed. And Ironman is something like life, you know, it's long, it's uh, tough. Um, it's sweaty. Um, there are a hundred thousand reasons to give up. There's betrayal. My body betrayed me. Uh, the twists and turns, there's nobody coming to help you and you got to figure it out, but there's joy, there's ecstasy, there's fulfillment. And, uh, then I heard the music and they tell you that when you hear the music and you see the lights, you start to run. And I don't know where I got the energy, but I ran. It was a very, probably a very clumsy run. Um, in that deserted uh, Mexican island at um, uh, 12 o'clock in the night where there were only some drunks left. But this is what a finale of an Ironman looks like. This gentleman came up to me just before I finished and I said, he said, hey, can I run in with you? I was like, sure, knock yourself out. I'm going to just say hi to my family. I gave the kids a high five and um, he was the world number one. He finished the race, gave his press conference, had a shower, came back and um, he was running in with me. And this is what it looks like. If I can toggle the switch. Wow, here we go, racing out of a four-speed rider, you would say. Here we go, Dinesh Arad, you are an Iron Man. So here on the next thing, they say that he's world number one and he's running in with the first time. Iron Man. Well, that was pretty cool. First timer crossing the line with the men's winner. Incredible. And then it got real quiet. It was so powerful. The music and, um, you know, that was it. Um, I, uh, uh, that was the finale. The photographer had left and my daughter took that picture. I did get the tattoo and that's what an Ironman certificate looks like. So the other day I'm coming out of the pool and this young lady comes up to me and um, she says, uh, excuse me, sir, you got this tattoo on your arm and I've seen it in some of the athletes here. Are you in some kind of a club? I'm like, yeah, well, you can call it that. But I said, you got to earn your admission into this club. She's like, how's that? So I tell her what an Ironman is and I can see the wheels in her mind start to turn. I hope I got the wheels in your mind start to turn. Thank you for having me. Thank you, World Nation. Nickel, back to you. Well, the day that was incredible. You covered a lot of ground, and you certainly got the wheels turning. Um, you know, and you also touched uh, people. The first comment we had today was from Zari from 1965, who talks about um, uh, you know an unfortunate uh, situation in school where someone passed away uh, when he was there. So. Clearly, what you've talked about is, is uh, incredibly important. You know, I'd love to chat with you uh, about a couple of things. Let, maybe start with the Ironman quickly because you just finished there. Um, would you do it again? Um, yes, it's, um, uh, it's more a family issue. You know, you're basically a wall from family life. Um, I used to go to bed and, you know, by, by, you wake up at four and do all this stuff. And I was out by 7 p.m. in the evening and my wife was such pretty much not existed as a, as a family man. So you, that's the part of the training is, is tough. It's lonely, it's not glamorous. Um, and, um, but yeah, I would like to do it again. It sounds a bit like the training to be a cardi uh, cardiac interventionist as well. <laughs> I would do that again too, in a heartbeat. Similar to that. So uh, I think questions are on, on, on the heart are on, sort of two broad buckets. One is uh, around people's personal ability to access these treatments and, and what it's like. Um, 
And the second is, um, uh, you know, just what it's been like for you as uh, in that role, how you made your career choices. And I'm sure there are lots of young Laurentians watching who might want to try to emulate you. And so uh, maybe we could talk uh, a bit about the, the healthcare side first and then talk about the career side after that. Yeah. So on the health side, you talked about how you could go to a doctor uh, and come out and have no indication that anything's wrong and then uh, ha have an event right after that. Uh, how do you know that you're at risk? Well, the risk factors are the things that I talked to you about. Um, we are all at risk. I mean, living is a risk. Um, if not from, and that's what I tell patients, I, you know, when we go for a risk of a procedure, I said, listen, there was a certain risk you took to drive from point A to point B. So your body is an incredibly complex, um, you know, organic um, system and a machine and the things will go wrong. So all you can do is stack the odds in your favor. And those are the few things. That's what you stay healthy. You eat right. You exercise. Don't smoke. All the things mom told you about. I mean, it's... Um, it's the same thing that holds good today. I mean, uh, I go and my mom still gives me the same lecture. Um, you know, see your doctor regularly, get that blood pressure under control, make sure you're not a diabetic. These are the simple things that you can do to stack the odds in your favor. But you can do everything right and something bad can happen. And, and that's why it's good to have a doctor in place, have a plan in place. It's like everything in life. If you plan for something, if and when it happens, you're prepared. Okay, so I see that um, uh, others are also asking you whether you want to do it again. You, you've addressed that. Um, J.S. Krishna, I think he may be your classmate, says, is there yes. any, anything called bad cholesterol now? Uh, I thought uh, that had changed to no such thing as bad cholesterol. There, there is. Um, the cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, and um, you know, J.S. is a dear friend, is called LDL cholesterol. Um, that is still bad cholesterol. What they have changed, and this is where it gets a little confusing, they have changed the cholesterol requirement in diet. They thought ingesting cholesterol in the diet would reflect on cholesterol levels in the blood, but that's not true. It's saturated fat and even you know pure sugars that can lead to LDL cholesterol levels. So there is a bad cholesterol in the blood. And even that, uh, you know, the cholesterol recommendation they made in diet has been a little controversial, but um, it's somewhat true because you do need some cholesterol. So there's good cholesterol, which is HDL cholesterol and bad cholesterol, which is LDL cholesterol. And even the LDL cholesterol, there's a specific subtype, which is super bad. Got it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about access. So, you know, you said you're not the, the Johnny Charles in the ocean, but you are the Johnny Charles in, in the lab. Now, uh, a lot of folks are watching this from around the world and the question is, how do you know that, and how do you get access to this level of care? Um, and the equipment, the surgeons, the uh, access to the valves and, and implants and so on, um, how do you get access to it? Well, in the United States, um, you know, and I keep telling people this, um, uh, I say, we are very fortunate. I mean, we have all access to all these technologies almost I mean, we are a medium-sized city, Daytona Beach, and uh, we pretty much have access to everything short of a complete heart transplant. And even that, we have uh, you know avenues nearby that we can uh, send patients to. But that is a challenge in developed countries, and that's why it's even more important to try and not get to that point. I mean, if you have a bad valve, you've got a bad valve. Uh, you will have to go with whatever techniques that's available at that point of time and what the financial situation is uh, is there. And um, it is a little overwhelming for us. Uh, we can't um, change the world, but we can change a few people. And, and when you and I talked uh, earlier, I said, if we can influence a few people to change their lifestyles, go to their doctors, we would have achieved the goal of this particular program. Okay, good. Um so, you know, you, you, you joked about how uh, doing procedures like this is sexy for you and not necessarily for the patient. One of the fears that I think a lot, a lot of people have when they go to a doctor is that they're going to get overtreated or get uh, treated based on the preferred uh, procedure that that particular doctor has. How do you deal with 
that fear? It is it is a problem, and I I, I will not gloss over that. Um, it is there are a lot of um, uh, you know um, interests that go on, especially in um, developed countries where the oversight is not um, that uh, strong. In the U.S., we have a lot of oversight over this. So, and in my honest personal opinion, at least with the people I've dealt with, I'll tell you that 99.5% of doctors that I interact with on a daily basis want what's best for you. Um, I talk a lot of patients out of procedures and anybody over 85, I have, I really talk to them whether they need procedures. I'm not a big, even though I do procedures, I'm not a big procedure. That's not my first recommendation unless, you know, obviously you're having a heart attack, you need a procedure, you need a procedure. But um, we, we have, or it's a pure mechanical play, like some of these things, there's no treatment, it's a mechanical problem, it's a mechanical solution. But uh, it's always nice to know what your, who your doctor is. And that's why I always encourage relationships. Um, I don't look at my patients as uh, patients. I look at them as people. We, we know each other. We start, it's a gradual process of trust. And um, I wish I could say that this wasn't a problem, but it is. And it's, it's not a bad thing to get a second opinion. I, I in fact, if, I, if I'm having an issue with the patient, I tell them, listen, you need to get a second opinion. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Unselling a procedure or unselling what you do, uh, I think applies in any any career in in any space as a way of developing tremendous trust, uh, because it removes that element of of, of self benefit. Uh, so the next comment. Um, oh, okay. So it says, "Call me biased," but that was absolutely mind boggling. That comment is from Rajesh Arab. So I'd say yes, you're biased, but you're actually right. That was mind boggling. The question is, assuming we all have a fair bit of blockage in the arteries, is there a preventative maintenance procedure to clean up the blockage? Something like servicing a car, perhaps. Um, no, there's no procedure, okay? There's no procedure that you can do to um, uh, clean it up, but you can even stabilize plaque. If you um, eat healthy, then and diet is huge here, and I'm sure, you know, we have some lifestyle sessions coming on, but um, with a good diet and with keeping that LDL cholesterol, you want that closer to 75, especially if you already have plaque, you can prevent that plaque from uh, progressing. But if you think about what's happening as your body ages, these tubes are in there for say 50, 60, there are no tubes that exist that can be pristine after 50 years. It's not possible. You're going to have some plaque. The key is to try and stabilize that plaque as much as possible. And that's where drugs come in like statins, aspirin, um, you know, and talk to your doctor, the other drugs they can use to stabilize that plaque and even prevent it from breaking off. So but that's, that, that's Nobel Prize uh, waiting um, in the wings as we know which plaques can break. We know they're, they're called the vulnerable plaque, but we don't know when they're going to break. And the person who figures that out, that's a Nobel Prize right there. Okay, great. It's a great segue to the next question, which is from your batch, which actually asks about aspirin, yes or no, for primary prevention. And you mentioned statins. So should all of us be taking aspirin or statins after a certain age? Aspirin for primary prevention um, is uh, uh, not recommended anymore. And primary prevention versus secondary prevention, just to clarify, primary pre prevention is if you don't have the disease, secondary prevention is once you have the disease. It does prevent a heart attack and stroke for primary prevention, but it's offset by GI issues and GI blades. So it's a kind of wash, but secondary prevention, definitely. As far as statins for everybody, I wouldn't, I would not recommend it. I'm not a big medication guy either, but if your LDL cholesterol is up, absolutely. Okay, so I see Arjun is on. Now, before I hand off to him for the final question, I will say that, that first of all, thank you, Dinesh. That was an incredible talk. And uh, you've also been very generous uh, and really spoiling the reputation of all surgeons by offering to answer any questions you haven't been able to get to offline. So, um, you know, if there are any questions that have been uh, left up uh, in, in the chat uh, that haven't been addressed, uh, these are going to be addressed uh, offline. And um, there is also an email address that I'm going to give you in a second that if you haven't been able to ask your question, you can send it there and the nation has agreed to answer it. That is contact at ola-nation.com, 
Once again, contact at ole-nation.com OLE and the nation will answer your question. So over to you, Arjun, for, your, uh, for the final question. Nish, that was actually superb. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to leave you with a question because if I may, uh, Nikhil, if you allow me to ask him a question. It you wasn't seem to mind be, blowing. You, you, hear me? <laughs> you, you, you seem to be actually uh, pushing your heart with this Ironman exercise. And while you may think that your brother looks better, I haven't seen him, but looking at your mug, I'm sure most of the people get a lot of trust, as Dick Cheney will agree. Now, you mentioned age, you mentioned genetics, you mentioned smoking. You don't mention one thing that all of us love to do, partake in a dram, you know, every evening. And I also noticed that you're collecting a lot of wine. So does that mean a little bit of red wine and a dram every evening will help thin your blood and keep you in good shape as far as the heart goes? Yeah, that, that, that whole thing started with something called the French paradox. Uh, they looked at French people and they were eating a lot of saturated fat and they were expected to have more heart disease. But when they looked at the stats, it was less and they attributed it to the wine drinking. It's a little controversial, but there are some substances in the wine that are antiplatelet, you know, those things that form a clot and uh, antioxidants, the flavonoids and the phenols. And so the WHO and the AHA says one to two glasses of wine is acceptable, but obviously they're worried that they'll turn people into alcoholics. Um, uh, the, the data between wine, uh, you know, fermented and distilled uh, stuff is, is still not very clear. But if you have a drink a day, I think you're going to be okay. Um, just make sure it's the right size drink. And that, that's, that's what that boils down to. Okay, great. I, in fact, I also love the, your entire presentation peppered with a lot of humor and, and you know, your, your smiling face and clarity, which you put across. In fact, it had my heart racing occasionally as though I was there doing the procedure. And I was wondering whether it would go right or wrong. So I'm sure a lot of us felt the same way. Thank you very much, Dinesh, and thank you very much, uh, Nikhil, for uh, moderating the session with Dr. Dinesh, which has been extremely interesting, and I'm sure you're going to get lots of questions and people reaching out to you. Thank you. I'm waiting for Rohan thank, to bring on you. session thank two. You. Bye. And now, the next session, we have what we call the Wings of Determination, which is an inspiring story of success and progress in spite of odds. Moderator for this session is from the batch of 1976. And the batch very recently paused to remiss over a lost, well liked, and a popular classmate. This session is thus dedicated to Lieutenant Simon George Pinamotel, a naval aviator, while on a maritime reconnaissance flight during the monsoons, passed away unfortunately in a crash in 1985. His sister Sarah and brother Rear Admiral Philippos are both Laurentians. A NAP fighter presented to the school by the then Air Chief three decades ago is dedicated to Lieutenant Pinamuti and three other old Laurentian pilots who gave their lives for the country. It now adorns the lawns adjacent to the top flat. Moderating Kanika Tekriwal will be Sudhir Rao, Vindhya, 1976. Now, who's Sudhir? Sudhir, having worked for over three decades with General Motors, Renault, and the Volkswagen Group as a former chairman and managing director of Skoda Auto India, Sudhir is known as the car guy. He then pursued his passion to support green mobility solutions as the managing director of Bombardier Transportation India. He enjoys building competitive enterprises through strong teams and mentoring young talent. He is grateful to Lovedale for giving him a strong foundation and a value system on which he falls back to today. Take it away, Sudhir. It's all yours. You can bring, as soon as uh, Nika comes on, the floor is yours. Until then, we're glad to. Thank you very much, uh, Arjun, on behalf of uh, Batch of uh, 76. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Kanika Tekriwal. In 2005, uh, she is the CEO and founder of uh, Jet Set Go, a company that manages and operates India's largest private jet and helicopter fleet. Kanika started working in the aviation industry at a very young age of 17, juggling college and a full-time job in Bombay. 
this was after she did her plus two in Bhopal. She left school in the 10th. And uh, <clears throat> she then went on to found Jet Set Go in 2014 uh, after her uh, MBA at Coventry. And her goal in life is to essentially redefine what flying private means. And she wants to find the fastest possible connectivity between point A and point B anywhere in India to begin with and maybe later in the world. It's an amazing story. Uh, it's a company that in six years has grown to 150 crores and most importantly has done that profitably. Her vision and execution have earned Kanika several laurels. The Government of India's National Entrepreneurship Award, Forbes 30 Under 30, BBC's 100 Most Inspirational Women, the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leader, and goes on and finally CNN's 20 Under 40. On a different note, going back to the discussion of health earlier, um, she has actually displayed the true spirit of never given. She has battled cancer, come through it with flying colors at a very critical stage in her life and without giving up any of her dreams. Kanika, over to you to tell us your story of true grit. Thank you so much, Sudhir, for that lovely introduction. I mean, um, you know, I'm going to outbeat your previous <laughs> bombardier at connecting point A to point B in the fastest possible manner. But yeah, so um, I left school, like Sudhir said, in 2003. I was batch of 96 to 2005. And um, I think I joined school as the youngest in my class about a year, year and a half behind. And um, I came from a very different background. didn't go to any preparatory school for Lawrence, etc. And I was thrown in the deep blue sea with that. And uh, I think with Sudhir, we're going to go into details of how Lawrence panned out, what happened, etc. But uh, I'm going to skim through briefly of what we've done and how we've oh, done yeah. it. And, um, you know, where, uh, how we, how Jetson Go was formed, etc. So from a very young age, I actually wanted to, um, I was very passionate about starting my own business. And I remember in school, there were lots of times where I would wake up on a bad day and say that, oh, I'm going to start my own business and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, and et cetera. But I never really knew what it was. I went on to study um, design in college, to be honest. And um, I, it was during my college that I started working with, um, with a company where I was supposed to be interning with them, but I ended up working full time and I, was, I learned about aviation over there, I was given this chance to actually set up their aviation department or aviation business altogether at the age of 16 and a half, 17. And I always joke that I got paid to learn. And I was, I had a team of people who were probably twice or thrice my age. I was this obnoxious, nasty kid who would think that um, I could get my way through anything. And I was trying to run this company like Hitler or Veerapan, who that says is my friend. But um, yeah, and so you know, I learned a lot there in those three years. I, I I learned how to be a human being. I learned how to make mistakes. I learned a lot of stuff. And then I learned how organizations work. I learned how to read a PNL. I learned how to you know run through a balance sheet. But um, it, it really got me um, going. And I think I was very lucky to actually be able to work in a business which I was very passionate about, you know, do something that I really loved which I think a lot of us don't get the opportunity of doing. It was only after that, that um, I went on to do college because obviously working wasn't an option anymore. I had finished school and um, I was trying to, uh, I was trying to basically, um, I graduated um, college actually, and I had to go away from um, work. I had to leave work and do something else. So on the facade of actually going to do my MBA, I went on to work in the UK and um, went on to work in the UK and basically figured out how to um, learn a lot more about aviation. Basically, I was heading this company called Aerospace Resources, um, India, Depart India, Asia Pacific Division, more or less, if you can call it that. And that's when reality struck and I really learned a lot more about aviation. I learned how to be more responsible. And uh, like Sudhir so briefly touched upon, I came back and I was diagnosed with cancer, which I think got me back to reality and made me realize what I really have to do. 
and it was post cancer when you know everyone said no one's going to give you a job you can't do this you can't do that etc etc that is okay i got to figure this out on my own and uh, cancer kind of made me feel like i was indispensable i mean i was not indispensable what's the right word invincible <laughs> and i could pretty much go out and do whatever i felt like and with this and i think that's when i really learned the meaning of never give in because whenever anyone said that um, oh you know how are you going to do this or how are you going to do that or how are you going to recover from cancer etc i used to always think i mean i'll figure it out and i think that's my biggest learning from school that it actually taught me to never ever um, give in to keep going to have this resilience to have this drive which is which you just don't give up on so i moved to delhi to set up this business and of course, obviously the early years weren't um, easy a lot of people laughed and joked about it some people said uh, you know phone pe kon plane book karega and you're a girl are you sure you can run planes i remember going into a meeting my one of my first sales pitches and i entered a board room where um, i was the last person to enter the room and this the act- the person who was actually hosting the meeting says ma'am can you get us a cup of coffee and ask around what whatever anyone else wants and you know that's where all my self confidence and drive and everything went down the drain i said look he's not going to treat me like a business owner he thinks i'm going to get him a cup of coffee today of course um you know they uh, he's my biggest customer he's also very fond of us he's one of our biggest motivators but um built the business slowly by slowly learned did it profitably and um yeah i think i'm giving wings to wayne reeves but more with sudhir i think i just wanted to touch upon what what the story briefly he's got an interesting set of questions which i think will keep everyone engaged you're on mute sudhir okay um thanks a lot kanika so um just to set the stage for everybody just to explain to everybody exactly what it is that you've created as a product as a company so when you say that or when the world acknowledges that you have transformed private aircraft travel in the country you and your team what does that mean what exactly have you done explain that to everybody so you know um to be honest i think when i started off with the idea of jet set go um i simply wanted to be the make my trip of private jets and we said okay you know what there are about 200 plus private jet owners in this country and unlike airlines there's so many of them how do people actually reach them and how do people actually book these planes and in my head i thought that oh booking is the biggest problem and i've got to solve that so i went around making a platform not knowing the t of technology this was in 2011 2012 where mobile apps also were so common and i said oh so everyone's going to come and list their planes here and everyone who wants to book a plane will come and book it here and i'm going to be like the next facebook of the world and it's going to be so easy and i think that was the first mistake <laughs> so the bubble burst on the day our first flight happened where um, the flight didn't happen so we got a booking and the plane never turned up and the customer hates me till now <laughs> and of course i think he has a fatwa against my name or something but um, that made us realize that booking is not the problem that needs to be solved what needs to be solved in a country like india is service delivery um service commitment quality and finally the delivery so i said you know what if capital isn't a constraint let me go out there and buy planes and we went back to the drawing board i'm not a great excel warrior but i had friends who were great excel warriors and um you know we figured out that even if we went and bought our own aircraft we're never going to be able to give the people who have their own aircrafts in the country competition because people were selling their planes lower than what it costed to operate them so i said hang on you know why is anyone doing this without um really i'm sorry can someone said this frozen pick no sound i don't know yeah just try to ignore that try and ignore that kanika try and okay, great. <laughs> yeah so you know so um basically what happened there was that uh, so i said you know what if people are selling below the cost of manufacturing that's a bigger problem to fix so of course 22 young and foolish i walked into a plane owner's office and i said you know what you've been losing so many millions of dollars the last 10 years and i'm going to fix it for you and obviously he was like hmm you know he looked at me with a lot of skepti- skepticism i managed to convince him and that's where our real journey began what we started doing was we started taking assets that belonged to um other owners and turning them around by taking control of the machine just like you would almost rent a house but we would pilot it we would engineer it we would run it operate it and um, you know 
bring very simple quick fixes in the chain wherein we would decrease aircraft ground time increase flying time decrease cost ownership costs decrease customer cost etc and slowly the step by step by doing that without actually owning any planes we became india's largest private jet operator um operating more flights than various airlines in india at a certain point of time um now we've come to a point where our demand far exceeds supply so in covid we went and bought our first two planes i don't know whether i'm going to regret this decision <laughs> six months down the line <laughs> but while everyone's busy laying off people and giving salary cuts we're buying planes so i hope we're doing something right <laughs> but yeah so that's that's more about what we do here yeah. okay, that's wonderful that's wonderful i've researched a lot as you know and that one <laughs> i did not i did not pick up <laughs> so, so i'm going to keep surprising you so this <laughs> good 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 looking forward to it so i know one of your dreams was uh, to get a, uh, the i think it was the uh, forbes award that i think yeah. as a i'm a teenager probably even as a teenager i think you said i want to be on the cover of forbes for 30 and you had an amazing journey you just bought two planes when you look back at the time you set your dreams together did you think this is where you'd be um you're in your early to mid 30s so when you look back and say where is where you know 10 years ago where do you think kanika would be are you there you know, i think it's a very hard question to answer because um i remember the day i turned 30 my first problem was i was like shoot i'm not going to be on any of the 30 under 30 lists anymore <laughs> and all my friends made lots of fun of me but when i was 20 i didn't think that would be a problem i would have at 30 so you know i think um, i'm very happy with wherever life's taken me i remember discussing this with you and i've said it very openly that you know i remember i talk a lot it's very hard to get me to shut up but um i remember when in an interview once someone asked me um you know if you were given a time machine and you would rewind your life what were the three things you would change and that was the first time i actually had to keep shut and i didn't have an answer because i got thinking and i said is there anything i would change and there would be absolutely nothing you know i i've never been a person who's had a five year plan three year plan or even a two month plan i don't know what i'm going to do tomorrow you know i landed in the city i am in today with one pair of clothes <laughs> yesterday and i was supposed to leave right now but i haven't left so i'm not sure um you know of where i wanted to be when i was 20 but the way i look at it is i think um i'm very happy with life and i'm very blessed with wherever we are however if there weren't um, the problems i wake up with every morning i probably wouldn't be very happy with it i think i love a problem i love a challenge otherwise life's just really boring yeah <laughs> and i know you're a person who's overcome a hell of a lot of odds um i think uh, i'd like to touch upon the health part um tell us a little bit about that uh what was that period like how did that change you and then i'd like to talk next after that about you were somebody who entered this industry nobody ever i think gave you any kind of odds to succeed given the nature of the industry you entered so two questions i'll let you go go with that one is the health issue and yet entering an industry which was full of challenges how did you get through that phase so you know i think um if i if i had to look back and you know the, i mean the, i love the way you team both the questions together because again you've got me thinking <laughs> which is very rare. but uh, so i think um you know it was never really a challenge at that time like i said i think i've been a very foolish person all my life and i've never really looked at anything as being impossible in any form or means and um, you know so i remember the day i was diagnosed with cancer i remember it very very vividly i'd come back home i was in bhopal and um, i'd been complaining about a pain in my arm for a year almost and my mom was like you've been complaining about this for a year why don't we go get it checked I think ha oh, yeah whatever let's go and then we go there and the doctor's pressing all over my neck hand arm etc and he's like hmm he's also a family doctor in a city like bhopal who's good friends with my dad so he's obviously very scared about saying anything to us and um, he said oh i'm going to send you for a little test we just poke a little needle and take out a little something and give you a very quick test i was like hmm how hard can that be and we go to the center and you know again living in this bubble of a world that i live in i should i should just look up 
and seen what the center read. But no, I walked straight to the doctor's cabin. And I'm like, he told me, you won't make me wait. You need to poke a needle, take out something and test it for me. <laughs> and the doctor is just looking at me like, ouch, where has this hurricane come from? So, you know, we did the test and um, the, we were waiting outside for the report, my mom and me. And she was like, you've been wanting to do an Indian chart for a very long time. Let's go. Let's eat this. Let's do that. And half an hour became an hour, an hour became an hour and a half. And I got really agitated. I said, you know, this was supposed to reach us in 10 minutes. What just happened here? So I stormed into the doctor's office. And that's when I realized, like, you know, there's a board over there saying cancer specialist, something, something. I'm like, hmm, now things don't seem too right. And I look into my report and it says, um, you know, tested positive for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I remember having this big, Blackberry was the size of a brick and Googling it on that. And the first thing Google said was Hodgkin's lymphoma is another type of this, this, this cancer. I, you know, I never once on reading that do I remember thinking, oh, I've got cancer. I was like, hmm, this can be cured. So what next? I, so, you know, it didn't uh, really hit. I think if I was older and smarter, it would have probably hit in a worse manner. But the very fact that I was 21, really foolish, and just laughed at everything in life at that time, it didn't really... Um, you know, drive home. It was only after I think, you know, the first treatment, the first chemo actually happened that it's that it actually hit that look, this is serious stuff and you've got to fight it. And um, I think, you know, during the treatment, I heard a lot of disturbing things of people saying, oh, even if you get cured, how will you get married? Or even if you get cured, you'll have so many issues in life. It was almost like no one really wanted you to get cured. People almost wanted you to die. And I think that's what kept me going. And that's what actually gave me the you know, energy to keep fighting and keep thinking of a life beyond. I remember, you know, there were days when I would come back from chemo and just feel like the whole world's come to a spinning stop and I want to end this right here. And then I would think about all the people who said all the nonsense in the world. I'm like, hmm, I've got to fix this and keep going. So, yeah, and you know, it, it, it's, I mean, in hindsight, it's not as hard as it sounds. I just think... Um, I always say cancer is the best thing that happened to me because it made me a better human being. I mean, pre-cancer, I was this nasty little brat who thought I could do whatever the hell I felt like and, you know, go boss around people and be a... Not that I would boss around right now, but I think much lesser. <laughs> and uh, I just think it, it, it really, really changed me as a person. It taught me how to be more humane. It taught me how to be kinder. It taught me how to be you know, a person of substance, if I may say that. It taught me how to look at life from a very different lens. And it also gave me this courage to, you know, go out there and believe in myself. Because I remember reading this book by Lance Armstrong. That was, it was much before he actually tested positive for the whole drug stuff and all of that. Where, you know, he, he gave me the courage and the motivation to keep going, keep fighting and keep believing in myself. And it just made me realize, the whole process just made me realize that you know, if you really believe in yourself, you have the power to do whatever you want to do. There's absolutely nothing in the world that can stop you from achieving what you want to do, how you want to do, if you believe in yourself. You know, it's all about you. It's not about um, any external force. There's no doctor, no, I mean, nobody in the world who can help, you know, who can do what you can do for yourself. And which is why I say, you know, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. I, I, um, but I give a lot of credit to cancer for making me the person I am. And yeah. So that's on the first question. Now I'm a little confused about the second question. I think I forgot it by talking. No, no. So here's it's related to that. I mean, I think in the phase of the cancer, um, you also were in an environment which didn't think you could or should or whatever do go out into this world, make a mark for yourself in the manner you have. I think people around you may have felt you should go off in a different direction uh, as a person, as an individual, and find your calling elsewhere than what you probably either did not reveal at that time or what I can't exactly recall that phase of your life, what you had told people you wanted to be. The skepticism uh. <laughs> you overcame to... <laughs> to do what you have done. <laughs> and, so and I'm talking about it from within your own inner circle, if you will. Yeah, so... Um, because that happens a lot, right? I mean, you know, I, I think this is obviously uh, an, an, an evening where we have a cross-section of generations. So... Of course, yeah. <laughs> 
So I I think um you know I'll tell you what Sudhir is referring to and um now that I think about it he's given me so many hints to talk about it too but uh you know I remember standing in Bombay at Aran's house and a lot of people had accumulated um you know down below and I was standing on top of the stairs and someone said oh even if she gets cured how are you going to get her married etc etc and I remember coming down the stairs and saying don't worry I'll be on the cover of Forbes in 5 years from now and uh, this was in March 2011 if I remember right yeah March 2011 and 23rd of March 2011 to be precise and then 5 years went by we were in the cover of Forbes a lot of times of course but i'm sorry we were inside the forbes a lot of times not on the cover not on the list and uh, i remember waking up in january and thinking oh you know what the hell five years are going to five years have gone by from now and this still hasn't happened what what am i going to do etc etc and um, you know then came march 2016 and i got a call from singapore from forbes mm-hmm. asia saying you made it to the list and um, we would be delighted to have you over for the shoot etc etc and it just gave me so much um, you know reassurance in my not i think it, at that point it didn't even matter that you had made it onto the list because it just seemed so easy like i was like hmm is this what i was really wanting <laughs> and how did it happen so quickly <laughs> and then it was a goal post you wanted to achieve but then when the goal when you actually make that goal you're like was my goal so easy is this all i wanted and then i always joke like since then i think i've led a goalless life because i've not been able to figure out what what do i really want and how do i really you know i mean it just made me realize that if you would really again like if you really believe in yourself and if you keep, really keep going there's absolutely nothing in the world that can stop you from you know wanting to be who you are or do whatever you are you've done a lot um we haven't talked about the kinds of people obviously i don't think we'll go into names or anything but you you got some really powerful people as customers so can you explain <laughs> what you achieved in terms of what's at stake the kind because if you don't perform there's a lot of very powerful people who are going to be very very upset <laughs> because their day day hasn't quite gone the way it want it should have gone so give us give the audience a sense of what you've actually achieved from a customer base and why you're so important to some of them so you know i think um uh, if you look at the industry from a very outside nascent knife perspective you think okay we are we fly a bunch of really spoiled rich people from point A to point B and you know the people who want to go into commercial planes etc but the reality behind it is you know every single person flying with us today is that point 1% of the country that controls the livelihood and the futures of the balance 99.9% of the country be it from the government or be it from the industrial space or be it from the medical space you know um the people who every minute or every second is very very precious and you have absolutely no scope to goof up just to give you an example you know if i don't know if polgate messes up on their packaging they probably lose five customers but they still have the whole market share and they can still keep growing it if i have five pieces of cucumber in a salad instead of the four pieces the customers requested i have lost 5% of my top line <laughs> or even more because the one customer is going to go and tell 10 more customers will tell 10 more customers and that's it that's the end of me so i think um, you know i mean i say cucumbers as a joke but you know i mean we're dealing with private jets we're dealing with helicopters which are machines at the end of the day you you know if anyone from my engineering team calls me before 10 am in the morning i know the day is going to be a really horrible day because either something's gone wrong with the plane or the plane's made a landing somewhere or the plane's not taken off from somewhere and we have a passenger on board and that's the worst way you can start your day it happens once a month on an average because these are all machines and they do get spoiled and it's beyond my control and then begins your whole you calling calling up the customer and saying i'm so sorry but this has happened and this is how we're going to deal with it and etc etc you know i remember in the early years i remember the first technical failure we had instead of addressing it i just cried and i cried and i cried because i was so scared about what are we going to do how am i going to handle the customer the customer instead of getting angry was sitting and consoling me on the other end of the phone saying it's fine we'll wait don't worry figure out your backup aircraft but it really taught me a lot you know it taught me that at any given point of time you have to have a plan b plan c plan d it taught me that however important the person is he or she is also a human being and they also make mistakes so if you are honest and truthful and if you tell them what's really happened 99 out of 100 times they will support you they will help you and they will help you overcome the problem 
at the same time if you lie and if you try to cover up or if you try to you know make it look like the world's come to an end and you're not at fault you're going to lose all your customers so i have a very simple policy that you know whatever happens good bad ugly if the food doesn't reach the plane because your head of in flights ordered it late don't tell the customer that the caterer screwed up say yeah my team screwed up i'm responsible for it and the customer really appreciates it at the same time you know if you have a flat tire on a plane which can happen at any point of time don't say oh the weather was bad or the world's come to an end you just say look we made a mistake somewhere and we're fixing it but you know at the same time like while i make it sound i think very easy it's obviously um, a very very finicky audience you're dealing with more often than not most of our customers are doing four cities in one day three cities in one day timing every second of their day you know they're always on the move and you've got to enable them you're not in the business of giving people this beautiful private jet and making them fly in luxury we're in the business of enabling people to achieve to perform to build the country to grow the country and build their businesses so you know if i delay someone by half an hour for a meeting i don't know how important that meeting is or how he's trying to change the world so i'm duty bound to ensure that you know whatever they want is done fair done and if you upset one customer god bless you you know you go to another one and you go to another one and that's it this is a very word of word of mouth industry i don't get customers by advertising in magazines or putting up billboards so um, i think a large part of my day i just goes into ensuring how do we keep customers happy all the time okay wonderful thank you um this is i guess a question to uh, to get the thinking going among the the youngsters in the group here um one of the people i spoke to is a classmate of yours who described you in the following manner and she says quote on quote kanika has great clarity of thought and is very decisive you're young um you don't have a lot of algorithms to fall back on in your head in terms of okay this can happen that can happen this for therefore we should do this and she was very very impressed that you are able to quickly grasp process and decide and feel very confident about the decision you've made and have your team march in a particular direction so what do you say to the youngsters in this group about how does one develop that self belief but more importantly back up that self belief with stuff with concrete performance how do you get that in you even at that young age what we think, think of as young age by the way i know you, <laughs> you probably think very differently age. you probably think very very differently <laughs> but let me be <laughs> yeah interesting but yeah um so you know i don't know um the way i look at it is i think there's no decision which is ever right or wrong you know it's about owning up to your decisions and it's about doing what you think is right at the end of the day like you know i look at it this way um we've got one prime minister who this one man who's in charge of the lives of a billion people you know one wrong decision and they go all of us they go all of us similarly the way i look at you know a decision is very simple is it honest is it integral am i hurting anyone am i damaging anyone am i going to regret it in the long term you know so i have this list of questions that always plays on in my head before i do anything and if i tick most of them i just probably go ahead and uh, i think i'm an inherent risk taker you know i come from a marwari business family i've seen everyone take risks throughout my life i always see everyone keep working work hard keep going so i don't think um, taking risks has ever been an issue however i think um, taking decisions is not something i think it's more about confidence you know if you've got to be able to own up in your decisions even if you've done something even if you've taken a wrong decision you've got to have the power to actually own up to it and believe in it and say yeah i messed up the, most often than not you know i own up to my team and say i'm sorry i think i did this wrong which is why i'm not scared of a decision that i take or of a you know something i jump into but i think uh, you know i i don't know if i'm capable of giving advice it's too early in the day you like you said young i'm very young to be giving advice right now but uh, the way i look at it is you know whatever you do in life even if it's a decision to go and have a cup of coffee with someone do it if you know you don't have to hide it lie about it or you know crouch behind the wall whatever you do do it with a sense of proudness a sense of you know being able to openly do it and you know you're not doing anything wrong that's it yeah okay wonderful i'm going to sort of segue away a little bit uh from uh the jet set go the professional 
side, if you will. We are an OL nation. We have to talk about school. Um, so we shall do that. Um, but before we do that, a couple of comments. One is uh, for everybody listening. Uh, there's quite a bit about Kanika's story on YouTube and on Google. So if I'm not covering certain aspects of her and you're intrigued about how this young Laurentian has done so much in life and made our institution so proud, um, there's a lot out there. So I'm sorry I can't do justice to everything in the short time we have because I do want to talk about school a bit and then I want to train myself to become current Joe Hurst. So we're going to have a little wrap. <laughs> I, I turned 60 a few months ago, so I've got to find a second life here. <laughs> so you're my guinea pig here. <laughs> Done. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here's a performance appraisal for you um, at this stage. I, yeah, okay, there you are. So there's something that's come online. I won't mention the name. Um, I don't know if I sh am allowed to by that gentleman. But this, I think it's a gentleman. I assume it's a gentleman. Sorry. Maybe bad assumption, but anyway. Kanika is someone I have engaged with very closely since I came into corporate aviation and I have ah, never I met anyone with such a drive to succeed and the hard work to go along with it. A woman of great heart and mind that moves 10 miles a minute. Now, I have a strange feeling because <laughs> of another conversation I've had with you. Do you already know who this is? Of course, I'm too smart. So, okay, that's rapid fire starting right now. Who is that? Captain J.S. Krishna. Is okay. You're absolutely right. <laughs> so, I'll repeat that. I'm sorry I was talking to you. That was Captain J.S. Krishna. Um, that's, is, some, is a man or a lady? It's a man. It's a man, okay. Um, here's, a, here's another performance appraisal for you. And I know you know who this is because when I threw it at you, you figured out exactly who it was. Um, I have this quote unquote, I have used her extensively. She works hard and is a go-getter. Always tries to find a solution to a problem. So, um, I, I don't know, <laughs> I, I don't have permission to talk about that, but I guess I'm going to take a risk. You can, you can, you can tell us who that is. It's um, Vikram, he's one of my customers, yeah. yeah so it's my I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep it with that. I'm not going to say the full name and get into trouble, no. Yeah, so it's my batchmate, uh, Vikram Kedlowska. <laughs> who as part of my research I was trying to figure out if, if Kanika has happy customers or not so she clearly has so Thanks. wind up your performance appraisal you talked about entering a man's world being treated as a woman being treated as a bachi you know all of those go make cupcakes what the hell are you doing here and this is for all the young girls out there so I have a question for you are you absolutely relishing the fact that you've proven a bunch of male chauvinists wrong? No, not really. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't think I was in the business to prove a bunch of male chauvinists wrong. I think I was in a business to make sure I can eat all the cupcakes I want, which I am <laughs> doing. But uh, I think uh, it was more about, you know, proving to myself what is right. And... Uh, I think it was more about waking up every morning and being able to look into the mirror and say, yeah, I'm going to kick ass today and I'm going to rule the world. I think in the early days, you know, when you're much younger, since you call me young, you think about, okay, I want to prove this one wrong and I want to prove that one wrong and I'm going to do this. But as you grow up, I think it's only about proving to yourself what you're capable of. You're your biggest competition. You're your own biggest judge. And I think to me each morning, it's about having the ability to wake up and smile and smile through every problem that floats into my phone saying engine garab ho gaya or the landing gear nikal gaya or yahan pe tire mein ye issue aa gaya i still laugh and say oh we're going to get through this like cake work so i think uh, you know now it's more about that but yeah earlier i think when i was much much younger i would be like hmm this one said this and you know what now i've done this and this one tried to shut me down but you know what he shut down but i don't think it matters anymore <laughs> yeah okay so we're going to uh, try and keep this as quick as possible um done. But uh, talk a little bit about Lovedale. Um, what did school mean for you? What about school did you take away, good or bad? And um, you know, what did it do to you? And uh, your message to, I guess, the broader Laurentian community 
about your lessons learned and how others who may go down that same path. And I, knowing, you know, I've spoken, I mean, I've probably done a day's research on you, by the way. So, wow, now I feel really cool. <laughs> so I happen to know, know the thing here. And, but I can also tell you that you are probably not alone. And, and I'm sort of asking this difficult question uh, with that in mind. So You're speaking for a few, quite a few people. No, I don't know. I think, um, so, you know, I've never had any qualms about, uh, I've never hidden what I've done in my life or what I've been through in my life. And I think that was a lesson I learned very early on in age when someone told me, don't tell the world you have cancer. And I was like, hmm, I'm going to tell everyone I have cancer. So I've always been very open with whatever my story is. Then, because, you know, one day someone's going to go and try to dig out skeletons and, you know what, they're not going to find any. And then I'm going to have the last laugh. <laughs> but uh, so school was not a bed of roses for me. You know, like I said, I went into school much earlier than I should have at an age much younger than I should have. I didn't come with the background probably that most kids came with where they came, went from a preparatory school and they knew what boarding school life was, etc. I came from a place where I had a maid help me get ready to go to school in the morning. And then you throw me in this world where I didn't know how to tie my shoelaces. And everyone I think who was in my batch or two years above me will remember this incident where every morning I would go without with my shoelaces untied. And people would keep asking me to tie them. And I almost got violent with someone saying that, look, I don't know how to tie my shoelaces. And that's when began my downfall with school. So I was never the most popular kid or I was probably the most unpopular kid. And I have absolutely no qualms in um, we're talking about it. I was bullied to a large extent. I didn't, I didn't have a choice, I think. To me, it was about, you know, do I want to go back to that school in Bhopal, which is not going to do anything for me? Or do I want to stick it on here and keep dealing with whatever's coming my way? And, you know, in hindsight, when I look back, what I don't hate school and I don't have, in fact, if anything, I am very thankful and very grateful to, for what school's given me because it made me a person who was strong enough to take anything. You know, it made me a person who believed in myself. I look at a lot of others out there from school and I think they don't have a life beyond school. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, but their whole social circle consists of just people within a particular framework because they were so comfortable in their skin which is great but you know at the same time for me because I was never that person who was comfortable or um, you know who had that stability I've learned how to you know accept strangers I've learned how to embrace change I've learned how to go keep exploring the new world I'm not saying I'm better or worse than anyone I've got some brilliant batchmates you know I've got some incredible people who've been part of my life like you can't imagine today some of my closest friends are people from school and um, you know they've been with me through thick and thin uh, the past few years I think we've gotten closer and closer however that being said I think um, it wasn't the best part of my life school but at the same time I think I'm very very grateful for to it for teaching me how to never give in I mean I kept surviving that life and I kept running it and I kept living the unhappiness, thinking I'm going to get out of it and I'm going to make myself so proud. So I think I could attribute a large part of whatever life's given me today to the lessons that school taught me. And uh, I think, again, school also contributed to making me a better person because, you know, today I would not have anyone else be bullied or treated the way I was because it happened to me. You know, so I think um, I'm very grateful to school and I don't, like I said, I don't hate it. But at the same time, it's not my favorite thing either, yeah. Okay. So... <laughs> Um, you know, I, I openly say about the fact that I, I really, and I, uh, I didn't blossom at school. I think I liked school. I enjoyed school. Um, but, you know, did I come into my own in school? No. Uh, I'm very also quite open about it. I, I, but I do love school um, a lot. Um, maybe blossoming in other aspects, if you will. I learned a lot. I think my values were completely formed in school. But anyway, this is not about me. It's about you. No, that I fully uh, agree with. Yeah. So no, I, 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 in fact, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think it taught me a lot of stuff which I would have never learned anywhere else. And it also taught me the value of friendships. It taught me the value of relationships. And I think a lot of the culture I can see that's gone into um, that's gone into bec me becoming me as a person has been thanks to school. Yeah. So I think every single value that I possess. I completely give it to Lawrence School Lovedale, completely. And I absolutely am passionate about school because of that. And 
as far as skills, if you will, or other aspects, you know, or confidence, those kinds of things, those came to me probably in college. But anyway, like I said, it's not about me, it's about you. So let's do a little bit of a, um, a rapid fire, okay? Uh, one memorable experience you had at Lovedale. And this, uh, is, just, this is literally, you got to give those answers. <laughs> there is no, no more words than, than one or three, as the case might be. Mm, I'm thinking, jumping into the pool when we were supposed to. Okay, the, the last phrase <laughs> is important. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I did yeah. One experience or habit at Lovedale that still is a part of who Kanika is. Eating raw Maggie, for sure. <laughs> okay. Um, if you could change one Lawrence School Lovedale rule, what would it be? Cross country every morning. <laughs> okay. Describe your senior year in three birds. Tenth. This is tenth in your case. Tenth. Um, lots of fun. Yeah. A lot of fun. Okay. Um, did you have any mentors along the way in your life? And is any of them associated with school? And did school help you professionally? So I think, um, you know, I've never had mentors throughout. And that's one thing I really regret. And I keep looking for them. But I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to get you onto something else. So I'm going to get you onto an incident about professionally. And then you'll get what I'm saying. So I was in a meeting in Chennai with someone who I was really, really scared of. I was meeting him for the second time, I think, and I was like, hmm, this person's like Dracula in real life. And why do I have to deal with him, et cetera, et cetera. But then he was really nice and he came on a Sunday morning to spend time with me. And we got talking and um, somehow, I don't know, something led to something, something, and we spoke about school. And within 30 seconds, that person from being Dracula became my best friend. And, you know, he went all the way to drive me back to the airport, which was an hour long drive after that. And he was really nice. And today I proudly call him one of my closest friends and he's been there for me, for me through thick and thin and many, many years my senior again. But uh, so I'm not sure about whether it helped me professionally or not. But the one thing I re I've realized is that, you know, Laurentian, Laurentian, wherever you may be in whichever part of the world, whatever you may be going through, the way we stick for each other, I don't think many people do. And, um, you know, I'm very grateful for that. Like, I'm... I, just, I sometimes think, what if we didn't speak about school? And what if I didn't say the only relationship I have with this part of the country is that I went to school in Lovedale? <laughs> Would things still be the same for me? So, yeah. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to, sorry, give you one more uh, quote here that's important. Uh, we need a thousand or more Kanika type of business leaders in India to get the country to where it belongs, at the top. Now, let me push Kanika a little away from the commercial service <laughs> in mind to look in another direction. So the question is, should the Indian aeronautical industry focus on small general aviation aircraft manufacturer rather than large? So I think let's take it offline. It's not <laughs> I can talk about that for another hour. Given that my senior who never forgets to remind me he's my senior um, and a much better trumpet player than me is staring at me on from the screen here. <laughs> So I do have to ask you one last question. Looking back at after all of this, okay, 15 years since you left Lovedale, do you have fond memories of school and are you now a member of the I absolutely love school club? There's only one right answer. There is <laughs> oh, only absolutely, one right yes. answer. You know, even if I was sitting in front of you, I would say the same thing and I'm saying it behind the screen also because none of you can throw tomatoes at me right now. <laughs> but okay, so absolutely, yes. Okay, yeah. so let me tell you that there's actually a rule in school that uh, we made up in the last three years when I was associated with the school administration, that anybody who gets more than four awards, you know, that are globally recognized on their 25th year as part of the school fundraising has to give a crore to the school. So can I call your batch rep and tell them that your <laughs> crore has already done deal. That was easy, that's done, don't worry. 25th year, right? Lots of time to go. So, don't worry about it. So how Prabhupada Nair is, is listening, he can write it in. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he is, yeah. Ten years from now, there are many crows coming in as part of the alumni. I've got lots of years left for my 25th year, by the way. Okay, so uh, Arjun, <laughs> over to you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Kanika. Um, Thank, um, you. Thank you so much. Today. Thank you, Kanika. I'm sure that's inspired a lot of young people as well as young ladies. I'm sure what you're able to do, but I've got a little question for you. And uh, I'm sorry to play cop and uh, keep time. It's a tough job. 
and uh, we already went over time in the beginning it had nothing to do with you but we decided we'd try and keep time and you know I, i'm used to being unpopular for things like that so don't worry you and me on the same boat but you know you've been on forbes you've been on bbc you've been on almost all media houses wherever and you're only in your 30s and uh, are you planning to be the uber in the sky uh, what are you pl- looking forward to what are the innovations can we get a little bit short answer please because we're out of time short answer can we look into your mind and tell us what's coming in the next 5 years forget about 10 as far as you are concerned as far as we are concerned as far as audience is concerned what are we looking for i think you were very very simply put you are going to be looking to looking at flying from home to work and not driving from home to work and i want to leave the rest to your imagination and some research that you can go into okay thanks a lot thank you sudhir thank you kanika we've enjoyed having you uh, here and before i can take much of the time i'm going to hand you back to rohan who's going to who will unmute himself and he will tell us more about uh, uh, what's going to happen later on thank you very much and thank rohan you. all yours Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Arjun, for once again doing a great job as my co-host. Uh, we now, oopsie. So I actually remove Arjun, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, we've, we've, gone, we've, uh, we've gone a bit uh, beyond time. So I, uh, I, I hope you have enjoyed this session. Uh, the nation's talk was... Uh, you know it was not that technically it appealed and it uh, we connected with all of us and obviously we uh, loved watching uh, kanika and listening to her and her stories and we wish everybody you know all the very best we our next session uh, is going to be on the 22nd of august uh, it's independence day month uh, we are thank, trying to work something around it i would like to end now uh, by thanking the folks who also work along with me the rest of us behind the scenes to make this program uh, relevant to all of you so thank you to my ol nation working group atul veer 75 kalpana kutaya 80 sachin abraham 95 rashid kapadia 77 murad lala 81 and adrian kennedy 65 and of course everybody else who was on the show once again thank you very much a few housekeeping notes we are still looking for volunteers to help us we are looking for ideas we are looking for suggestions to make this more relevant this is your show and see you next month thank you very much rohan sherry vindya 86 signing off bye bye